Thanks for joining us here on WRCA Radio. And joining us on the line is Brian McLean, formerly of the group Love, and uh, joining us here talking about a, a solo project. Brian, this, this project has been in the works for you for a lot of years, hasn't it? No, it hasn't. Really? As a matter of fact, it was sitting in my garage, and uh, I was away, and my mom discovered these tapes, the lost tapes. And you, were you under the impression that they were destroyed? Uh, you mean, did I hope they were? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, had you forgotten about them to the point that, you know, it, you thought... It, as it lends itself to this conversation, yeah. I mean, if you had have said, hey, do you have tapes in the garage? I would have said, yeah, I, I have tapes. But my mom, you know, uh, took the time to, to catalog them, to, um, you know, arrange them. And then, amazingly, I mean, what are the odds? She got a deal. Right. And, and, and these they, are like demo tapes, you know, guitar and voice. And they, they sound good. I mean, the tapes have lasted pretty well, haven't they? Where did you record these at, Brian? Uh, <laughs> that, you know, wherever. Basically, it was stuff that my mom found. Uh, some of the things, I think, were catalog reference tapes that were done, you know, in New York back in the 60s. And... Um, other stuff that I might have just sung into a tape recorder and, and like that. So. I, I guess um, a lot of these songs, uh, were, were you looking at it as a focus to, to take them to the band that love, or, or they were they ones for your solo album, or, or how did you look at it? Uh, at the time, they were for the band. I was working away. Arthur was doing, Arthur was most of, Arthur's what you heard most of. Mm hmm but that didn't stop me from working away in you know in my own little sphere of existence and it just when it came time to what what we were going to do on a specific album arthur had you know the the uh veto power and the things that you heard up until this you know release were the things that he didn't veto was that somewhat frustrating to you when you you did these songs and they they were turned down so to speak well, the question becomes abstract in the sense that, that I was having such a great time that it was the sort of thing that I didn't let bother me. But I'm sure, yes, I mean, you know, if, if it, it crossed my mind. But I probably was thinking, you know, this is going to last forever and I'll get a, we'll get around to this stuff. Otherwise, I might have put up more of a fight, you know, or, or pressed harder. You were, you know, so young, but, you know, a lot of these songs are, are pretty serious songs, pretty heady stuff. I mean, were you, were you a pretty serious guy in those days? I was delirious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have to admit to you that, that I hadn't heard any of this stuff in, in 20 years either, and I was pretty amazed. I guess that, uh, I, yeah, I was thinking. I was trying to figure it all out. I was trying to get the hang of it. And I was addressing, you know, issues of life, even back then. So, yeah. I, I don't know if serious is the right word. Deep. Deep. How's deep, man? <laughs> hey, this guy's deep. <laughs> <laughs> One of the songs that uh, stands out to me is, is a song called Orange Skies, and I believe uh, Love did that song as well. But that was, the, was that the first song you ever wrote? 17 years old. I was actually a uh, roadie for the birds at the time. And uh, I wrote that song from uh, Roger McGuinn's, he was Jim McGuinn then, his guitar break in the Bells of Rimney, which is, you know, the, if you listen to it closely, it's the same configuration. The beginning of Orange Skies is the same configuration. But, I mean, you were living, th that was kind of a dream. I mean, here you were around the birds, probably one of the best bands of all time, and then, you know, you're, you're writing things. I mean, you were kind of living a dream life at that time, weren't you? Yeah, we were on the first Rolling Stones American concert, uh, concert tour and, and uh, traveling around and, you know, ringside to the, the spearhead of the, of the, you know, the rock revolution and this and that. Yeah, it was wonderful. I, I can't be calm about how really great it was and how much fun we were having. Hmm. I know that, uh, too, creatively, I mean, it must have been just an amazing time. Uh, I mean, the creative juices must have been flowing, so to speak, Brian. Very much so, and everybody 
felt that they were, you know, we all felt super, we, we felt like supermen in the sense that anything that we came up with would be realized or would, would come to fruition. That's one of the reasons I probably didn't fight to get more of my stuff on those albums is because I just assumed that everything that I did would be heard. And, uh, you know, that's a tremendous uh, inspirational uh, factor. You know, if you think you're just speculating and, and, and working away possibly for nothing, for no reason, but it's like, imagine writing a song and then a few months later driving along and hearing it on the radio. Mm -hmm. That would be pretty heady, I would guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah very much. Amazing. Who influenced you musically? Uh, do you remember? Yeah, in the beginning was David Crosby. I I wanted to sound like him, and uh, but earlier than that, it was you know Lerner and Lowe, Rodgers and Hammerstein. Uh, my mother danced the flamenco, so you know uh, there was that influence. The, you know the years of of hearing the gypsy, you know the Spanish gypsy music, and flamenco music, and uh, I love jazz. And uh, you know how it goes. Sure. And then, of course, I guess when I was nine years old, I bought my first Elvis Presley record. Sure. And I'm sure the Beatles came into play somewhere along the line, too. Well, of course. I mean, that changed everything. Mm -hmm. I walked out of Hard Day's Night different. I was never the same. Mm -hmm. I just immediately identified with that. You know, I let my hair grow out and got kicked out of school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just immediately. I mean, that was that settled the the high school whether I'm going to finish high school question right there. <laughs> that was all taken care of. <laughs> yeah, the greatest decisions in our lives we don't really make ourselves. I don't know if you ever noticed that. That's probably true. We realize we made them, or they were made in retrospect. <laughs> Using your, you know, listening to some of these tracks, I mean, you use your voice as a musical instrument, which is very interesting and, and very well done, I must add. Uh, do you know where that came in? Was that some of the jazz influence? Barbara Streisand. Oh. Yeah, I, I idolized and, and worshipped her, and Harry Belafonte was the other big one uh -huh. that I, I would just sit and listen and go, oh boy, you know, and, and my, you know, my, my, basic reaction to either one of them was gee every time i think i can sing then i just put one of these records on and i get and i get back to reality but you know it's whatever you're whatever you're striving for you know shoot the moon mm -hmm. so i was imitating um that kind of vocal ability looking back on the on the history of love uh, what do you feel the best love album was um, well, I mean, qualifying it by the fact that, that they never captured what we were like live. You know, Forever, Change, Forever Changes was the most symmetrical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in the first album, we were just trying to get the hang of it. And, and in the second album, for some reason, we got derailed and, you know, put that big, huge, long song on the, on the other side, which is a shame. There's a lot of other stuff we could have done that would have been better. Then by the time Forever Changes came along, we were beginning to get at ease with what we were doing. And uh, uh, if I had it to do over, I wouldn't have quit. I was kind of lured away, and uh, it was not a smart decision. But uh, it was probably the best decision in the long run not what happens it's how you end up mm -hmm. I you know I guess looking at the love albums still sell well uh, does does that surprise you after all these years absolutely sure I mean we were I mean we're supposed to be this obscure little garage band this little street band but some guys were here from England doing a documentary and and we were talking about it. I guess the thing that people long for from the 60s is being able to put uh, an LP or, or you know or a CD or whatever it is on and being able to listen to it through both sides you know and and enjoying every song mm -hmm. and I think that's the thing that's gone and I think that's the thing that people are longing for um, anytime I hear anything that I like on the radio uh, it, you know you go out to buy the record and that's the only thing on the whole record you like 
That's true. <laughs> do, do you still write songs very frequently? Sure. Do you? Huh? Do you try to uh, you know, actively go out there and get them published or get somebody to record them or anything like that? I don't lift a finger. That's not what I've been put on earth. I mean, that's I haven't been given that ability. Uh, I guess that's probably one, one of the reasons you haven't heard much. But uh, now people are interested in, in getting it out. Uh, you know, pe- people are are interested on. I mean, we're not even talking. We're talking not even minor leagues. This is like little leagues. If if anything, if there's any interest, you know, it basically will be word of mouth. My goal in, from the beginning, writing music, was to be timeless, to to transcend age or or uh, style, and to enrich people's lives. To to make them feel better about just life in general and you could hear that even back then and that's my desire and it's like i say you know it's it's like the longer it takes the better it's going to be mm-hmm. so uh the fact that this is starting to happen now is in a way it's it's amazing it's kind of like tying up of loose ends but maybe it's the beginning of something that started back then uh, I've got as many songs from that same era that I'm talking to my producer right now about going in and recording. Basically the same format, just very simple, guitar and voice. Maybe I might overdub some harmonies and, and uh, <clears throat> maybe put a string or two, but you know it'll be basically the same. So if I call you up 10 years from the date today and uh, we're doing this interview, uh, <laughs> what would you like to have accomplished the previous ten. <laughs> well, I just want you and I to be a lot closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, between you and I, you know, I'm I'm writing a book. You know, who somebody said change your career every couple of decades. Right. You know, I'm writing a book. I've got a couple of more book ideas. If you're carefully observant, you'll see that I wrote some liner notes. And uh, I'm trying, you can see I'm trying desperately to let people know that I have some kind of gift or writing ability, you know, as far as, as being literate. And uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to develop myself in character and as a person. And, and uh, so that when uh, I walk down off the stage and everybody says, oh, that, you know, the music is ver- so wonderful and so rich and s- that when they meet me, they're not disillusioned, which was the case for many years. You know, mm-hmm. you would see, you would hear this sort of transcendent music, and then you'd meet me, and there was this snotty Beverly Hills sort of bratty kid, you know, kind of drooling at the girls and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, in ten years, I should have made a lot of a lot more headway. And, uh, you know, uh, even though I'm a half a century old. I don't think that there's any problem with thinking that I could meet somebody and start a family. Oh, uh, good, good luck with your goals. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Brian, and uh, we'll keep playing your music here on the air and uh, keep us posted on how it goes with the book and everything. Good luck to you. Absolutely. Thank you.